Propagation Society, being one of the 85 selected for National Academy of Engineers 2011 U.S. Frontiers of Engineering Symposium, the NSF Career Award in 2008, the Intel Logic Technology Development LTD Division Achievement Award in 2003, the 2000 Raj Mitra Outstanding Research Award, and a number of best paper awards from conferences. She was, she was elevated to IEEE Fellow for contributions to computation electromagnetics uh, in the class of 2016. So with that, I finished my introduction and I, I now pass the mic to Professor Jiao. You may begin the webinar. Mm -hmm. Yes, th thanks to Sayyam for the uh, nice introduction. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, thank you all for joining this event. It's a great pleasure. Uh, to give a talk uh, to this chapter. So I hope I, I could visit you in person uh, instead of just uh, uh, seeing you virtually. Uh, so I'm Dan Zhao uh, from Purdue University. So can you uh, see my slides now? Yes, we can see your slides. Okay, great. Uh, then the... Okay, uh, okay. I would ask the participants to please mute themselves because there is some noise coming. Please, all the participants, kindly mute yourselves. One second. Yes, and uh, uh, when you have questions, definitely uh, <coughs> feel free to unmute yourself. Then ask ask a question anytime. Uh, if, if there are any, uh, yeah, see the I, you don't have to wait until the end to to answer the uh, to ask the questions. And feel free to stop me anytime. So uh, today I'm going to uh, give a talk on fast solvers for electromagnetics based analysis and design of integrated circuits and system. So shown here is a typical computer system. This uh, small area, so you, this, this is quite tiny actually, the brain of this system, which is so-called central uh, processing unit or microprocessor. Then the CPU is housed in another square. This square is actually package. Uh, in the early days, package it, it is just used to deliver power signal to the CPU, then provide mechanical support, uh, satisfy thermal constraint, etc. Nowadays, the package is also a uh, can be made very complicated where uh, you integrate multiple chips uh, on a single package. Then the package is mounted on the board. So the CPU here, the smallest one, the CPU actually uh, represents today's highest integration technology. So in 1980s here, I have a, a figure Chips. Uh, uh, in 1980s, so the number of transistors, the vertical axis is uh, transistors in log scale, and the unit is 1,000. So you can see the early 1980s, that time Intel's first CPU is called the 4004, 4004, so it's just uh, uh, no greater than like 10,000 transistors. So the actual number is uh, two, over just 2,000 transistors on the chip. These days, right over the years, you see it has progressed uh, based on the, this projection of Moy's law. Moy's law described it very well. Every 18 months, the number of transistors uh, doubles. So you can see the almost uh, 10 to the 10. That's like 10 billion transistors integrated on a single chip. So this is driven by the advancement of processing technology. They, uh, in 2000, at that time was already 180 nanometer, now 130 nanometer, 65, and nowadays 14 nanometer and even smaller. So the uh, almost reaching the uh, physical limit of the uh, device size that you can uh, put more and more de devices in the same area because of the 
uh, the advancement in, in, in semiconductor processing technology. Meanwhile, uh, the, this red line, as you can see, uh, has actually uh, depicted, has uh, shown an exponential increase, which is actually a hardware cost, total hardware cost. So the green part is design cost. The, the blue part is verification cost. So the hardware cost has also uh, skyrocketed almost $100 million for uh, a chip design. So the reason, there are multiple reasons why the design complexity certainly has exponentially increased. Think about you have to integrate over 1 billion transistors as compared to integrate just a few thousand transistors. That's definitely very different. Then second is uh, uh, uncertainties and process variation have plagued the uh, design and fabrication when we reach the physical limit uh, of the device size. Then the other thing is uh, the design uh, is not automated. Many steps uh, is not fully automated. Many steps are uh, manual, labor intensive, then uh, not accurate, inaccurate, and error prone. So when there are failures, say the design field, the designers have to spend months and years to debug the problem. Then what's wrong with the chip? Uh, so th these all increase the cost. The, to, to sustain the continued electronic innovation, so we, we definitely cannot continue along this trend. In recent years in US, uh, there is an electronic resurgence initiative, which calls for essentially, while well, the vision is for design automation, uh, can we have a machine generated CPU or the package this is uh, generated by machine computer, right? Uh, machine generated the board, uh, board. So you base, you have a say just a push button process, say which kind of chip you want and click uh, almost like the, the experience you get in online shopping. And in a few days, the, 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 the product you want arriving in the package. So it's, uh, if you can make the electronic design means such a, a fully automated, then the, uh, we can definitely uh, stimulate a lot of innovations and sustain uh, the continued electronic, uh, the, the so like probably the equivalent of scaling to moisture in another way of scaling it. But it's very challenging. So the SOC design, package design, uh, PCB board design, then uh, the, you, you have started from just uh, uh, your design intent. Then you have circuit schematic, synthesis, floor plan, placement, etc. how to make every step fully automated. Right? It's a multidisciplinary research. Bioelectromagnetics play a very important role here. Because you have to know your uh, device model, your interconnect model, so your analog circuit uh, component, your RF component. You need to characterize them accurately uh, using first principles. Then also you need to uh, uh, capture the global interaction, the interaction among these components. Uh, then putting is also not just a cost project, you have to make a powerful design software to, to make it uh, just push button process. So uh, this, this creates challenges, a lot of challenges too. So although the, uh, the computational elect electromagnetics or electromagnetic solvers <coughs> have uh, matured, right? So I have been developed for a few decades already. Now you have used, many of you may have used the uh, various uh, commercial tools. <clears throat> but the integrated circuits and the system, the design analysis creates additional challenge that drive the next generation solver development. So these challenges include ultra large scale. So the hundreds of millions of nodes are, are actually small for this 
when you study this kind of problem. Uh, the, uh, the chip package and the board together is also a multi-skilled system. The smallest size is nanometer, then the largest size is, uh, can be as large as centimeter and even larger. So you are uh, facing a few, like some order of magnitude difference in geometrical scale. Uh, the numer uh, numerical system you have to you solve is actually highly ill conditioned. Then it's broadband that uh, you have to make your uh, solver or your design software uh, work or make it correct, starting from zero frequency and all the way to light. Uh, say we have integrated optic, uh, optics. Uh, optical circuits, and then there are 5G and uh, high frequency communication circuits. Multi physics, so not just uh, uh, Maxwell's equations, you also have to bring in, say, quantum transport, uh, so magnetization uh, dynamics uh, to predict the, the actual performance uh, in advanced integrated system design. Say even for example the uh, the, the integrated say uh, memory technology, you might have heard of MRAM, uh, magnetic RAM, right? And uh, uh, it utilizes magnetic device uh, with ma magnetic junction and with MOS. So the it is a uh, this is not something on the paper. It's actually a product now, then to, add, to produce, to design that kind of product, you need to bring all these multiple physics into the picture to analyze it correctly. Uh, then there are uncertainties because the structure size is nanometer now, the, there are very, the width, length, thickness, etc. cetera. They, are, they just have a very small variation. It's similar to, to the original, uh, while it's, you, you try to uh, fabricate. So you, you have to take this into consideration in the design and analysis. And there are many other challenges. So uh, then to meet these challenges, uh, the state of the work, state of the art work done to overcome them, uh, to meet the needs of integrated circuit design next generation electronic innovation. Yeah. And in this talk, I won't be able to exhaust all the uh, fast software development. So I will just uh, uh, focus my time on, on the two topics. One is the fast time domain solver, the other is optimal complexity direct solver. So first let's talk about fast time domain solver. So show here are uh, uh, first order Maxwell equations. Uh, uh, you, you have seen this frequently. So the, there's electric field when it changes with time, right? It is producing magnetic field. So it's curl of H is epsilon or the partial D partial T, then curl of E is minus mu partial H partial T. Uh, when you try to solve this, Maxwell equation in, in a, a numerical way that you have to discretize this continuous operation. So the curve, when you discretize it, it becomes uh, it is partial E partial T uh, becomes the, essentially a sparse matrix EH multiplied by the unknown field H. So it's a sparse matrix vector multiplication after discretization. Then dh here is, represents discretized curve of epsilon. So h here is not just a single value, it's a vector, a column vector, that each entry in this vector is one unknown magnetic field you want to solve in your physical uh, structure. Then same thing for e, the minus dE, so it's a discretized curve of E divided by mu.
you also have to discretize time. So that's a space derivative, right? You also have to discretize uh, the time derivative. Now, if you do a central difference, so, so this is h at m plus half, then h and minus half, and the, uh, uh, the middle time is n, right? So this is a central difference based uh, discretization of time derivative of h. So this minus this divided by delta t is this derivative. Then producing curl of e at the nth time instant. Similarly, uh, you discretize partial e, partial t in time, you get this. So e at m plus one minus e n divided by delta t, then uh, you want to use m plus one because h and half uh, plus half has been solved from the first equation. Then uh, this shown in the right hand side, right? So then this time instant is a uh, uh, central time in middle of these two time instants. So making this uh, central, uh, second order accurate uh, time derivative. So this minus En divided by delta T is uh, East time derivative at M plus half time instant. So you, now you put the source in here, I omit the source for simplicity. Then uh, when you put the source in, you will show up here. So this is a very nice uh, explicit time matching uh, of Maxwell's equation, which is used by finite difference time domain solver. Uh, you, it does not need to solve any uh, matrix. You just uh, start from initial time. So it, say zero, zero uh, as the initial uh, time, both say it's the causal system. Both are zero, then you get your HM plus half, so it appears to be zero. But the one, the source comes in, right? So then this one, you put it here, then you can solve E at the next time instant. So start to become non zero. Then uh, you go back again. It's like leapfrog. So first, uh, from E and H at the previous time instant, you solve H at the next time instant. Now with each next time instant, no, right? This one is no, put it here with J, J is source, certainly is no. Then E at the previous time, uh, you get E at the next time instant. And you come back here, solve H at the next time instant. So forward, backward, forward, backward, uh, almost like a, a leap rock. So, this, but uh, uh, you do not need to solve matrix. You just, uh, you have a computer, uh, you just let it run, right? So it's, it uh, appears to be very efficient. Then you stop at any time and say, uh, after 1,000 steps you want to stop, then you, you can stop any, at any end time instant and collect your solution. However, for this scheme to be stable, the time step has to satisfy a constraint uh, which is uh, it's limited by the smallest space step divided by speed of light. It's known as so-called the CFL condition that many of you might be familiar with. So for integrated circuits and system problems, think about uh, we are dealing with nanometer size nowadays. You put a if this nanometer is too small, even you put uh, not that advanced processing technology node, say just a micron meter, which is one e minus six. So you put one e minus six divided by speed of light, you will end up with a time step at the level of 10 to the minus 15 seconds, right? Well, the spectrum, the frequency spectrum you are dealing with, so it, if we, these circuits, so just let's say at the gigahertz level at most, so the gigahertz, that's the time scale is 10 to minus nine, then the, you, you are uh, using a time step uh, of 10 to minus 15. So imagine you have to fin use many, many time steps to finish one simulation. That's very time consuming. So we have to overcome this challenge. Uh, then I, I call the, this 
as fast time domain solver, then there are implicit methods that address this problem, but you have to solve a matrix equation. So the research problem is, can we still keep the time matching like this? Uh, meaning explicit matching without solving a matrix while using a time step as large as possible. So if you can do that, then you just uh, choose a time step based on solely based on accuracy, right? So if it's gigahertz frequency, then uh, 10 to minus 10 seconds should be enough. Uh, or if you are dealing with kilohertz or even megahertz, then you should be able to use 10 to the minus three or one milliseconds. Use that kind of time step, right? So uh, then let's to, to, to realize that we can first do a stability analysis. So this is not something complicated. My the single page that I put down here covers the stability analysis for any homogeneous problem, the arbitrary structure. So you don't have to assume a regular structure or like free space problem to do a, a simplified stability analysis. This one is a comprehensive covering all the uh, material geometry. It, 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 it's uh, uh, applicable to general scenario, this stability analysis. It also, it's not difficult to understand at all. You simply, uh, this one is the left-hand side, essentially is H and E at the most once time instant. Then the right-hand side, the EN is uh, uh, E's previous time instant, right? Then this one is H's previous time instant. So you just rewrite this equation uh, into this form where the left-hand side is uh, the, uh, Field solution at the most uh, advanced time instant, n plus one. Then the right hand side is field solution at n's previous time instant. It's a, uh, right, the difference between these two is one time, inst time step. Then uh, you will get what is the rewrite the previous equation into this form. You will get this matrix, which is denoted by G. Now M here is nothing but this matrix is nothing but uh, dh multiplied de. So remember, d is one of epsilon curve e, and dh is, uh, uh, well, uh, d is uh, actually, it's operating on e, so it's one over mu curve. Then this one is one over epsilon, another curve, right? So it's a double curve operation. Uh, discretize, after discretization, become a sparse matrix m. Then for this to be stable, you just need the spectral radius of this matrix to be bounded by one. So spectral radius is nothing but uh, the largest eigenvalue of this matrix. So this uh, can be from this to this. You can simply uh, do a Z transform, right? Then you will see the Z is uh, the eigenvalue of G. Then for Z to be bounded by one, which is uh, say the error amplification factor, right? Bounded by one, you need the, definitely the eigenvalue of this matrix to be less than one. The modulus be bounded by one. Then uh, using this, you just do a few steps of derivation. Then you will end up with this condition. So here's the, this is time step, uh, delta t. The lambda i is, nothing but the, the num eigenvalue of M. So lambda square is the eigenvalue of M. The M is a matrix. So it can have uh, the size is N. So you have N eigenvalues here. Okay. Then this condition says your time step square multiplied by uh, eigenvalue square should be less than or equal to four. So this is, uh, you might think, oh, this is a new condition. Seems, uh, what's the relationship with the CFL condition, right? So actually the, this one means the same thing as the CFL condition. They do not conflict it. They do not have a conflict with each other. Because the lambda i, uh, lambda square is the eigenvalue of m. m is the curl of curl, right? This is, uh, 
B is Kurov E, then DH is Kurov H. So then think about how we do we do Kur. So we do uh, Kur is the space derivative, right? So you, you have one over uh, length uh, cell, say like discretization uh, cell size, then here it's one over another, let's just say space step, right? One over space step, one over space step. So then there is a mu epsilon that's speed of light. So you move it to the right hand side. This simply means delta T should uh, be bounded by space uh, step divided by speed of light. Should not go beyond that. So the, the, they are equivalent, okay? But this, the, uh, the condition I just showed that has actually very important meaning. So when you look at it, you see the one important finding is given any time step, not all the modes or the eigenmodes of M are unstable. Because see, you, you, you have M, then the, uh, it's eigenvalue lambda square, you list them from smallest, say lambda one square, all the way to the largest, right? Sort them from smallest to the largest one. The smallest is always zero because this is uh, uh, the M has a null space. It's a curl curl operation. So the curl of gradient field, when, when this field is a gradient field, curl operating on it is zero. So the, uh, the M always has a zero eigenvalue. That's the smallest one. So the, the smallest zero, so right, always satisfy the condition you want to to make it stable. So the delta t square num, uh, let multiply this. So you always have a, when you sort it from small to large, there is always a subset of eigenmodes that satisfy this condition. It's just the rules, the large ones do not satisfy. Okay. So this is a, a root cause of instability. Then in a, a traditional method, uh, the, you got constrained by the space step because you want you want to make everybody satisfied. So you you fix your essentially you choose a time step such that almost can be stably simulated, but you can do uh, differently, which is you can uh, choose modes right instead of choose time step you can choose modes whose eigenvalues can be stably. Uh, whose eigenvalues satisfy this condition and can be stably simulated and discard other, other modes. Then you might say, oh, if you do so, uh, the result will be inaccurate. That's not the case because here, the, when, when the time step determined by uh, your spectrum, say uh, one over time maximum frequency and the, now, the, due to stability, your time step constrained by the space step, right? It's very small. So you see the, the when these two have a big difference, those uh, unstable modes are not reported for accuracy either because they, they, uh, the, their eigenvalues are, are very far from your operating frequency. Then their uh, weights, in the field solution scale as one over lambda square minus omega square. So when the lambda is la larger than omega, their contribution to the field solution is uh, uh, decayed, is negligible. Then you, based on required accuracy, you can truncate without sacrificing uh, the accuracy you want. So uh, then, on one hand, you, you are able to choose large time step. On the other hand, you do not sacrifice accuracy. So then how to do it, right? How you, you should, surely cannot run your time matching uh, in the original way. You, you have to uh, fix it, fix the stability problem, right? And there are two ways. Either you, you find a stable modes, find those eigen modes that can be stably simulated, then uh, expand your field solution in the stable space and project the Markov system onto the stable space. The other way is you find unstable modes, right? Then you deduct them directly from the system matrix. 
to show you the uh, method two formulation. So this is still the original time matching equation. So the leapfrog, so how where the uh, h is a potent, then e is a potent. So it's the same equation. You just after curry the d, you add this uh, factor, deduct the uh, vh, vh is uh, unstable modes, deduct this from your system matrix d, then your numerical system will be free of source of instability. Now you can just march on in time with any large time step you want. So you, you, you want this delta t, then you find the corresponding wage, and you deduct it from your numerical system. If you are working on second order system, do the same, uh, you, you can fix the problem here after this M matrix. So the, surely you need to find, uh, you do, want, do not want to solve uh, an eigenvalue problem to find the wage. Right? So we also develop a fast method to find uh, these uh, unstable modes. So uh, show a realist, uh, say, uh, let's show the example to demonstrate unconditional stability while uh, still being uh, explicit in, in time matching. So this is a simple structure, but uh, it, it, it helps it illustrate the concept. So you have one micron, six micron, it's a very simple uh, parallel plate, but you know at a low frequency, it will uh, uh, behave as a capacitor. So char charging a capacitor. So this is voltage as a function of time. Then the current source is a Gaussian derivative. So the voltage, uh, when, when you apply a current source as a Gaussian derivative there, the voltage measured across the plate would be an uh, integration of the current, right? So that's how it comes out to be a Gaussian. Then you see the, because the frequency is low, so it's just a few Hertz. So you can use the time scale you look at it in second. Then uh, with this method, you can use minus uh, like uh, point, point 0.1, right? Or uh, one milliseconds, then all produce accurate results, agree with analytical solution. Well, if you use conventional method, because this is uh, space step is so small, so you have to use this small uh, time step. Okay, so it's a, a very big difference. Now, once you are able to overcome this challenge, you can deploy it in uh, for realistic application. Uh, I have an animation to show here. Let's see how to get yes. hmm. okay. uh, this page. Okay. Yeah. So this is uh, uh, the earliest uh, Intel CPU, right? The four, 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 we just, uh, let's just use it as an example. So uh, we want to create a push button process. So load the uh, GDS file of this chip. Then uh, the users do not need to do anything than just uh, run the, our design software as a command line. Uh, this in a, this is in a uh, Linux environment. So for this chip, it's after two hundred eighty four seconds uh, we are able to extract its get its electrical parameter at its circuit pin of interest. So the result is done now. And now shows all the step-by-step -step information uh, output on the screen. So this one is the uh, uh, most recent uh, processing technology. So the seven nanometer processing technology. So the, uh, there's no difficulty to simulate it either uh, using our uh, software. 
So you can see the it shows the water distribution across multiple layers in your metal nine uh, interlayer dielectric. So there are in total 18 layers here uh, where I show wattage distribution. So this one was done like less than one hour. Okay, so uh, next let me show uh, Second, the second thing I want to talk about topic is uh, optimal complexity direct solver. Time now the, okay. So, uh, Saiyan, so what's the time we have to finish this uh, seminar? Oh, we have lots of time, we can continue. Uh-huh, okay. Yeah, no it's uh, with the time, uh, yeah, definitely the, with uh, the second one, the, uh, I, I will try to finish it quickly. Uh, so the, if you are in this area, you probably heard about the, uh, the solvers have two major classes, right? One is the partial differential equation, the other is integral equation. So the uh, partial differential equation methods results in say, uh, the commercial tool will be the HFS, so which is a finite element based tool, right? Uh, of FTDD, they, they fall into this class, so they solve a sparse matrix equation, AX equal to B. Then the, for FTDD in time domain, you even do not need to solve uh, matrix. Right? So, uh, but in frequency domain, the, you, you are always have to solve a matrix equation. The direct solution for sparse matrix scale as n square for 3D problem, n is matrix size. So you have a, a 1,000 by 1,000 sparse matrix. If you want to uh, solve it, say in my lab would be backslash or inverse, right? Uh, what's the number of operations it has to take? You will have to take n square. Uh, operation, which is better than dense matrix. Dense matrix is n cube. Okay. Uh, but this is not uh, desired because when n is large, this is too too expensive. So a lot of time people study uh, develop a fast iterative solver where because for iterative solver you just need to solve a multiply x. Uh, just need to uh, not solve, just compute a multiplied by x, then check whether a multiplied x is close to the right hand side b, right? Uh, making this satisfied well. If not, then you move to next x. Then you move to next x until you, you find that x that comes close to b. Okay. So at every step, your operation is a sparse matrix vector multiplication, which does all the end. But in front, you have to uh, multiply. Your total cost uh, is, will be uh, plagued or the, uh, made worse by iteration number because you have to uh, iterate it. And if the problem is difficult to converge, you have to spend many iterations. Then also for each right-hand side, you have to repeat the iteration. That's time consuming. Then for integral equation method, you solve dense matrix. The direct solution is uh, uh, the complexity is even uh, larger than what you want. So it's n cube, right? So not, not if you put just uh, in my lab, you try say uh, 10,000 size. Uh, 1,000 you be very fast, but if it's 10,000 will be much slower. Then if you try 1 million, won't be feasible on, on your computer. So the iterative solution, there is another way to solve this also iterative solution, just every time the cost is matrix vector multiplication. So you do A multiply X, but now the A is dense. So you, you, you have to swear operational. Your faster solver, uh, which dramatically reduce N square to N or N log N, such as faster multiple based method of FFT based method. That's a big uh, reduction in complexity. But you still 
uh, depending on the problem, whether there are many right hand sides, whether it's difficult to converge, the your total cost will not be as uh, desired. For uh, for a problem with n unknowns, in general, the optimal computational capacity is all there. Okay, so as you can see, the 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 one I showed, the uh, since they are still far from the optimal capacity we want, we we we, we can reach. So there is a continued need for reducing the complexity. Uh, we already have a lot of faster solvers, but but when you think about the integrated circuit and system. There are hundreds of million of or even billions or 10 to the 12, right? Terror that rules you have to deal with unknown in those scale. So you, this is a, a bottleneck you have to overcome. So let me show, uh, show you the uh, one of our uh, direct solver. Uh, one wow, uh, of uh, so our uh, recent research, like past probably ten years, we have worked on a so-called H two based direct solver, which has uh, all the n complexity, the linear complexity for solving all these integrated circuit and uh, system problem. So let's see the uh, what is an H two matrix. So this is a, a structured matrix, but general enough to represent all the dense and sparse matrix resulting from electromagnetic analysis. So shown here, say the, let me uh, use this example to give a definition of this matrix. So you see, this is your computational domain. It has a lot of uh, unknowns. So each arrow represents say one electric field unknown. So this is electric field in that direction electric field in this direction, etc. You could just, uh, I'm using 2D as an example, you can have 3D, right, etc. So you subdivide it into two, uh, two subsets, then each subset subdivided into two, continue until you reach the smallest uh, subdomain, saying, oh, this is a, a size I can comfortably comfortable to really deal with. So this is, for example, leaf size is 10, then you stop. So this partition results in such a cluster tree or tree structure. So this root node or the cluster mean cluster of unknown. Right? So this uh, root cluster is actually represents the whole set of unknowns. Then you have two, right? Then you have another two, until you reach the leaf level. So this is like inverted tree. Then the matrix is essentially uh, the interaction between your unknowns, right? So you just uh, uh, put your put the row tree with the column tree. Then uh, the in so-called Galaki method, the, the row tree and row, the basis function are the same as testing function. So the, the row unknown and the column unknown are the same set of unknowns. Uh, they can be different too. So, but I'm using this as an example. So then you can uh, partition your uh, original matrix into such a, a H2 matrix structure where all the green blocks are so-called admissible and the red ones are inadmissible. So what does it mean? So it simply means say, you uh, level by level go down this tree, then check the uh, whether say this uh, row cluster and that's a column cluster, whether they are far from each other, right? or whether they satisfy this admissibility condition, which essentially says the distance between these two cluster of unknowns, right? Uh, uh, here is one, two, the other is seven, eight, right? So two sets. Uh, greater than the maximum diameter of each divided by eta, a positive parameter. Right? So it's uh, just uh, they have to be se separated. Then you also can use eta to define uh, how far you, you want them to be. 
then uh, once this condition is satisfied, it's admissible, it's so-called colored in green here, meaning this row class of unknown and column class of unknown are separated. Okay, uh, do the same thing for others, uh, check one by one, then if, uh, say one, three, four, and five, three, four, seven, eight, also admissible here, right? So this is a green block here. Then uh, one and the three, so it's here, so next level. So one, one is inadmissible, but one and the three is admissible, so colored in green here. So in this way, uh, you have a, a multi-level admissible and inadmissible blocks. This is, you can use any uh, matrix resulting from the integral partial differential equation analysis to do this partition. This is the, say uh, you take a square plane, uh, then you will end up, end up with such a H2 matrix structure. So the key here is, because the admissible block, the, the row unknown and the column unknown, they are separated. Then you can have a compressed representation. So you will have originally, it's original matrix is MN, right, GMN. Then now you can do VSV transpose, uh, where this uh, uh, is a K is the rank of this, uh, 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 factorize the form, right? So the, the left-hand side, you have to do square storage, but the right-hand side, you can see the, if, for example, K is a constant, then you just store V, that's linear complexity, it's all the M, then K square is a constant cost, then this is also all the N, when K is constant. So the right-hand side can be stored in all the N, while the left-hand side is n squared. Right? So this is more compact representation. Uh, then if k is not a constant, but still smaller than m, then you had the uh, efficiency gained by using this representation as well. So the VT is so-called a nested uh, cluster basis. So the, you know, the T has children, two children, T1 and T2. Then the V, each cluster has its uh, uh, VT. The children's VT and the parent VT has such a relationship where T is called the transfer matrix. So this is nested uh, uh, cluster basis. So like this one can use these two children uh, to represent. The K is a rank, then the S is called the coupling matrix. Then for the inadmissible block, it's uh, original form. You pick the original form. So that's uh, uh, H2 matrix. So you first have this green and red partition into admissible, multi-level admissible and inadmissible blocks. Uh, if you are familiar with FMM, the FMM also is, can be uh, categorized into this class of matrix, the matrix structure. Uh, then you, based on this uh, structure, the green one, you have more compact representation. Then the red one is poor matrix. So say uh, surface integral equation, you might be uh, have, if you work in uh, uh, method of moments before, so the electric field integral equation, right? The method, uh, the volume integral equation, uh, they come up all with a dense matrix. So this dense system can be represented by that H2 matrix. Same thing for partial differential equations, say FEM or finite difference. In Fruchs domain, you get a sparse matrix to solve. This sparse matrix also can be cast into that H2 matrix structure. Then we just need to uh, develop a direct solution. So how to solve this matrix, in, uh, factorize it or invert it in, in optimal complexity. Then because of time constraint, I'm going to just uh, uh, show you the uh, one animation to show uh, 
you how to do it. Okay, so we start from uh, the leaf level, then uh, factor each cl leaf cluster one by one, then uh, get the feeling, then also update the uh, other clusters. Then we merge, move them to next level. Then at each level is a H2 matrix. Then at the end, the, this red one is a small rank K by a small size of rank, then factorize as it is. So the whole procedure is essentially achieve such a, a LU factorization. Uh, the L is different from the common so the uh, L factor. So actually, the, our L here is uh, also uh, represented in a tree structure format. So you have all the tree level from leaf level to highest level, you have admissible block. And each tree level, you have 12 clusters. Each cluster, there is a, fact, a factor factored out during this direct solution. There's uh, P and Q are permutation. So the L is L factor associated with that cluster. Then this is the last L. That's uh, when you move to the highest level, that's the last L that's obtained. Then similarly, you have U uh, factors at each tree level for each cluster. Now, all of these uh, factors are of leaf size or rank size. So in this dark solution procedure, uh, you never need to uh, deal with the original large dimension. So at every uh, step of your computation, you are dealing with a rank size and the rank at the data tree level. It's very efficient. Uh, you get the inversion, inverse also explicitly, then you can do backward for the substitution. Uh, accuracy is controlled. The complexity, uh, you have a, a, a analytical, you can do an analytical complexity analysis as such. So uh, there are uh, these many tree levels. At each tree level, you just need to do these many operations. So your operation is always, uh, uh, by the rank, so the, based on the rank size, not based on the original metric size. So when the rank is constant, when you take it out, it's all the end, it's linear. So that happens, so, so the constant rank is uh, for integrated circuit or integrated system. Many problems uh, can be described by a, a constant rank matrix, H2 matrix. Then for electrically large, the K is also low rank. Uh, uh, it's uh, uh, actually dependent on the tree level Then you put that in, you can do a, a rigorous complexity analysis with electrically large problem as well. So shown here is uh, say, uh, also start from a simple example to just to explain the concept. So you have just the sphere scattering, the analytical solution, right? And you do uh, this direct solver, you're done already while you are using a uh, fast iterative solver. Still not done yet. Then you are doing a uh, full matrix space, let's say, the, for example, MATLAB's backslash, right? Uh, it's uh, slowest for this example, it's still doing its job. Uh, this is, uh, uh, the previous one was a volume integral equation solver. This one was a finite element solver. So it's a patch antenna, now over 3,600 30, elements. Uh, how the time scale with unknown, this factorization time scale with unknown clear linear scaling. The memory uh, with a number of unknown, right, it's a linear, then uh, it does not. See, the sparse matrix is in the, or the original matrix sparse, but its LU factors are generally dense. 
the sparse direct solution is a challenge too. Uh, not to say, oh, it's a sparse, so the direct solution is L and the U factors are sparse too. That, that's not the case. Uh, then the, uh, we are able to overcome this challenge. So also uh, with good accuracy achieved. Then a realistic example, this one was a full package we simulated before. The, uh, this, the one we discretize in uh, every layer. And this is a field distribution in the fan out layer at 30 gigahertz. So we discretize with these many unknowns. Uh, cost this much time and this much memory. Uh, compared with measurement, uh, we see a good, very good agreement here. So the measurement was done in time domain. So we extracted flux domain as parameters. I use these as parameters to do time domain simulation. Compared with other direct spa solver, uh, like Hadiso, Mumps, right? these are uh, the ones you, you might be familiar with, uh, the MKL Intel MKL library. So we, we are, uh, certainly my students are not uh, expert in software programming, but the, because the, the algorithm has no complexity. So no matter how, uh, just you don't need to be an advanced programmer co uh, making codes then because the operation you just need to spend this many multiplication, this many addition. So your end result, the scaling rate is totally different. This is quadratic, then this one is linear. Okay, uh, so in conclusion, uh, we, uh, I see uh, I, the message I want to convey is uh, the, the electronic innovation. Uh, so historically, say, uh, empowered by circuit community uh, uh, in like uh, the integrated circuit design. Now the when we move to like the 5G, the high frequency, and also uh, advanced heterogeneous uh, integrated circuit and system. The uh, EM is essential, electromagnetics is essential. Then uh, the, there are also unique challenges, which in turn drive uh, computational EM innovation that was driven by uh, like scattering analysis before, right? So then in this, uh, the new uh, engineering challenge uh, produced new challenge, uh, to new driving force then the CM has to address. So I, I showed a new generation of faster solver to overcome the challenges, uh, focused on two classes. I don't have time to exhaust the uh, others. Uh, then we should certainly uh, see good, very good performance. Uh, but still, the, the need to grow CM to meet new challenges. So uh, I'd like to thank all of my sponsors and also my students. This uh, picture we took last year when Purdue was uh, celebrating its 150 years. Uh, so also thank uh, MTD Society for, for sponsoring this uh, event. Uh, thank you all for participating. So any questions? Thank you. Yes, actually, thank you, Dr. Zhao, for a very informative session. Uh, yes, there are a few questions, so maybe I can read them out to you and you can address them. Will that be okay? Sure. Okay, so the first question is, do other frequency domain numerical methods such as FEM or MOM work for VLSI CAD or, or VLSI CAD? Yeah, sure. The the it's uh, it's just, uh, say what I presented today. Uh, let me show you. Gather it. Uh, let's uh, probably say the uh, the formulation. Is still the say when I talk about integral equation solver, right, or the uh, partial differential equation solver, they are uh, finite element methods, they are uh, methods of moments. The basic formulation 
are still this uh, uh, fundamental method, right? So they are surely, uh, uh, the formulation is uh, definitely uh, applicable. The numerical method is applic applicable. It, it's just the, the, the for large scale problem you, you have to overcome the computational complexity. Say if, if you just use a basic FEM solver, you, 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 the, the, the scale you can handle is very limited. Okay. Uh, then that's uh, the algorithm development, say you, how, what, what the fast solver as compared to a basic solver, so the fast solver accelerates, uh, still starting from your FEM formulation or MOM formulation, but the overcome the, uh, the computation, the computation challenges, the computational challenges. Uh, okay, so we have another question, which asks that, how do we compress G equal to V as V transpose matrix? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a very uh, good question. Uh, so, yeah, need to, uh, let, let's get to that page and share. Uh, yeah. Let me, okay, so share it. Right, this page says the uh, question essentially is uh, how do we get this, right? Yeah, so the, that's also, uh, uh, we, we have uh, published an, uh, a sweet, uh, uh, a series of papers also on this, uh, uh, on this topic, yeah. So why is, how to obtain this efficiently, right? How to obtain this representation? The second is after you get this re representation, how do you solve this matrix efficiently and with controlled accuracy, right? So the, these two are different. Then talking about how to obtain this representation, there are multiple ways. So it's uh, uh, one is uh, uh, say for this uh, um, uh, constant rank cases, you can directly work on the Green's function. So the Green's function is uh, yeah here, right? So then with uh, uh, so-called uh, uh, interpolation based method. So then you can directly work on this uh, uh, with function, then write it in uh, uh, separate the source from observer. Then uh, analytically obtain this uh, VSV transpose form. So the each VSV has an analytical closed form. Then uh, you build V, build S. That's one way for constant rank cases. Then it's not like you, you first generate the original, uh, for example, MOM matrix, right? Then you, you compress it, that will be too expensive. So then up front, the, you, you are already restricted by the original MOM's bottleneck. So what happens here is you do not generate the original uh, matrix. You start from your integral, integral operator, obtain this, uh, representation directly. Then uh, one I mentioned is uh, direct interpolation on the Green's function using Lagrange polynomial. Uh, that's one way. The second way is uh, uh, some of you probably heard about the uh, adaptive cross approximation or a pseudo skeleton approximation, right, which you can uh, select if it's rank K, then you can select just need to select K rows and K columns from original matrix to generate this uh, uh, low rank form. But the, uh, the low rank is not nested. So based on that low rank form, you also need to develop a faster algorithm to make it nested. Yeah, so uh, that's the other way. So we had a paper uh, on this, show how to do that. And also, if you are familiar with uh, MLFMA, 
where it's a fast multiple method, uh, then you can uh, start from your FMM representation. So uh, then uh, convert it to this form. So FMM actually already has this form. The S is diagonal then V is sparse here, but their rank is uh, not minimized based on required accuracy, especially for electrically large problems. So you, you, you do something there to uh, suppress its rank based on required accuracy. Yeah. Okay, so the next question is, can we work with method of lines? What is the scope of it in CEM towards 5G? Uh, I heard the first part, so the method of lines, what's the second part? The second part is, what is the scope of it in CEM towards 5G? What's the what uh, CEM towards 5G? Yes, uh, that is the question. What, what's, uh, 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 I heard the CEM, I heard the 5G. What's the uh, keyword there? What's the future of CEM? Uh, no, actually, uh, the question is, what is the scope of it in CEM towards 5G? The scope, uh, scope of CEM. Yes. Uh, a scope of CEM for 5G? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. So there's the, the, the uh, various understanding. The, 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 let me see whether I, I get the um, question right. Yeah, first, the method of lines, yeah, definitely the, uh, the it's a, see, the, it's probably the more on the transmission line. Uh, uh, Framework, right? The then the that's that's one method used for for uh, I think integrated circuit design also. Uh, but when you are dealing with uh, complicated three D structures, or the not just the uh, bus or, or transmission lines, so you have vias, right? Uh, you have uh, some other shape than. Uh, you, you will have to consider um, more advanced capability um, beyond the transmission line. But method of lines is surely uh, used, uh, it, it is one important class of method being used in this community as well. Uh, talking about the, the, yeah, the, five, the relationship about the 5G, definitely the, you, we, we see the, uh, a lot of a lot of things uh, are happening then uh, uh, it's so it's especially the right, the fixed array antenna design that also is very uh, tightly integrated with digital circuits digital integrated circuits uh, right then uh, yeah uh, put in a house in a very small box. So the how they interact with each other, the back end, the front, front end, right? So the, then the CM is definitely uh, very important here. Now also you, the CM has to do this very fast. It's, it's, as I mentioned, the, the design automation, the, why the design cost is so high. You, you want to, designers cannot wait like years or so even just a few months for you to produce a, a simulation result, you have to be as, like, for example, 24 hour turnaround time to make it uh, useful or make it relevant. Otherwise, uh, they will just pass the CM part the, to not do any, any analysis, just use other ways to work around it. Right? Then, but the, the design coming out of that may not be optimized. So the, while we can do uh, first the principle based the prediction, but we just have to do it fast. Mm. Okay, so the next question is, is the H matrix concept applied to sparse matrix with large, larger matrix size? Yeah, yeah. So what, what I showed the, the see the, 
the package example was uh, a full package example that was over 20 million unknowns. Yeah, so the, it was a large matrix that is a sparse matrix. The FEM is a sparse matrix. So the, actually it's a, uh, uh, when the source and the observer are separated, for, for the sparse matrix, it's not only low rank, the original matrix is not only low rank, it's zero, right? The, uh, the H matrix structure also applies to sparse matrix or sparse FEM, sparse uh, finite difference or other partial differential solver. Okay, uh, so, and the last question is, how do we optimize electromagnetic interference generated at microwave frequencies in chip level design? How to optimize, yeah. So yeah, definitely, uh, uh, that's a very good question. So the, it's first of all, you, um, you predict, you, you uh, right, uh, uh, predict the crosstalk, the interference. Uh, then the second is the, uh, you, do not just uh, uh, stay at the level that uh, tell people, oh, there was a crosstalk, there was interference. And the thing is how to use uh, that uh, uh, result to change the design, to, to reduce the interference. Or sometimes you want to use uh, crosstalk or use interference, right, depending on the application. So then the, uh, yeah, this this is uh, uh, definitely uh, uh, part of the uh, this research as well. So for example, when we do placement and the routing, so you have uh, different function blocks, uh, say in a package. So where you put the block A, where you put, put, put the block B. So in which way uh, you place them can minimize. Uh, satisfy a bunch of constraints, right? So it becomes a, a, a optimization problem. Then the uh, uh, so multi-variable optimization. Then uh, some use these days use machine learning, right? So try to uh, treat it as a black box study this optimization problem. But when you put uh, your domain expertise, your your EM understanding the intuition, the understanding you built after you did uh, first the principle based analysis, uh, you you can do this uh, optimization uh, in a more uh, intelligent way. Yeah. Okay, so that was all the questions we had. So finally, I would like to thank. Professor Jia, for a very interesting talk. It was a pleasure listen, listening to your lecture. And uh, we would also like to thank you for taking so much time and interacting with us. And we definitely and certainly would look forward to interacting with you again, maybe even in person when all this COVID situation is uh, better resolved. So I guess uh, we can end the meeting for today, tonight. Uh, tonight in India, today in US. Right. So it's uh, what's the time now in your place? Probably eight p.m. It's, no, it's seven forty p.m. Oh, seven forty. I see. Yeah. Yes. Oh, it's a very different time. Yeah. Thank you all. Then, uh, thank to the chapter for inviting me over. Yeah. Look forward to to see you in person in future conference. Yeah. Or the if you come to US. Uh, that uh, we probably have more chances to see each other. Mm. Thank, thank you, you, Professor. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. Bye.